Chapter 4 The Great American Bubble of the 1920s A satisfactory theory of the boom explains the depression. In the crisis what has been sown during the boom has to be reaped. Wilhelm Rupke, 1936 The events described in the first three chapters of this book, namely, the collapse of an international monetary system based on gold, followed by surging trade imbalances that resulted in rapid credit expansion and investment and stock market boom, overcapacity, asset bubbles, panic, collapse, and deflation, have occurred once before. The collapse of the classical gold standard in 1914 set off the same chain of events. Huge trade imbalances fueled the surge in credit creation responsible for the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression that inevitably followed. This other great American bubble is the subject of this chapter. Why the Twenties Roared When World War I erupted in 1914, the belligerent nations in Europe terminated their commitment to convert their currencies into gold at a fixed rate, thereby destroying the international gold standard that had been the financial cornerstone of the world economy since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Procuring the materials needed to conduct total war required government spending and trade deficits on a scale that would have been impossible under a gold standard regime, where money supply and credit are determined by the level of gold reserves. As gold left Europe to pay for material imports, credit contraction would have taken place there to the extent that economic collapse would have been unavoidable, and the conduct of war impossible. Consequently, the gold standard had to give way to a monetary standard based on government credit. Table 4.1 shows the explosion in government spending that took place in the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and, after it entered the war in 1917, the United States. The importance of the United States' role as a source of war materials can be seen in its ballooning trade surplus during the war years, as well as its rising gold reserves during this period, see Table 4.2. Table 4.1 Total Central Government Expenditure, 1900-32 Table 4.2 United States, when European gold flowed to America, 1910-29 Between 1914, when the war began, and 1917, when the United States became an active participant, U.S. gold reserves rose 64% as Europe exchanged its gold for American goods. Once the United States entered the war, however, it began to accept government debt from its allies as payment for war materials, at which point gold inflows into the country ceased despite a continued expansion of the U.S. trade surplus. Once the war had ended, gold again began to flow into the United States, since the American trade surplus remained high and as the United States allies began to repay their war debts. From the information presented thus far, it is clear that World War I and the collapse of the gold standard resulted in a surge of gold reserves in the United States, and an enormous expansion of public debt in Europe. It is important to emphasize that U.S. gold reserves could not have increased so significantly during these years had the European nations not abandoned the gold standard, just as the worldwide explosion of central bank reserves over the last three decades could not have occurred had Bretton Woods not collapsed. Predictably, rapid credit growth in the United States accompanied the surge in U.S. gold reserves, see Table 4.3. Table 4.3 United States, the relationship between gold, the money supply, and GDP, 1913-32. In attempting to discover the causes of the Great Depression, most studies on the subject limit their analysis to events occurring during the 1920s. In doing so, they ignore the doubling of the credit base that occurred between 1914 and 1920 and the impact this expansion of credit had on the country's industrial production. During those seven years, the value of the output of industrial machinery and equipment rose by 205%, and the value of the output of all producer durables increased by 257%. It was this surge in industrial capacity during those years that was primarily responsible for bringing about a situation of general oversupply by 1926, when wholesale prices in the United States began to decline, see Table 4.4. Table 4.4 United States, Credit and Industrial Production, 1910-32, Percent Change. Beginning in 1921, the Federal Reserve System began to control the money supply and credit growth through open market operations. In that year, it sold large amounts of government debt and commercial bills to counter the rise in liquidity being caused by a new influx of gold into the country. 
Consequently, despite a 19% increase in gold reserves that year, credit actually contracted by 8%, throwing the country into a sharp, although brief, recession. The Industrial Production Index fell by 25% in 1921 and Gross National Product, GNP, declined by 8.7%. Backpedaling, the Fed injected liquidity into the economy in 1922, producing a quick recovery. After these initial teething problems, the Federal Reserve System was able to achieve steady and moderate credit growth, averaging 4.8% annually between 1924 and 1929, and in this respect shares no responsibility for the asset bubble that was forming on Wall Street. However, the damage had already been done during the war years when the domestic credit supply had ballooned. During the second half of the 1920s, credit expanded at a moderate rate, but on the back of a greatly inflated credit base. When the real economy was no longer able to profitably invest the available liquidity in new plant and equipment due to overcapacity and falling prices, increasing amounts of money were shifted into the stock market. The bull market gained momentum just as falling wholesale prices began to cut into corporate profits. The bubble burst when profit growth was unable to keep pace with rapidly rising share prices. The reader will certainly recognize the similarity between the situation then and the situation today. Share prices plunged, credit contracted, bankruptcies proliferated, and a banking crisis developed. Conclusion The events leading up to the Great Depression were the same as those that created Japan's bubble economy, the Asia crisis, and the new paradigm bubble in America. When the discipline inherent in the gold standard and in the Bretton Woods system ceased to exist, trade imbalances produced an expansion of international liquidity. In turn, surging liquidity permitted credit expansion that resulted in overinvestment, overcapacity, asset price bubbles, and deflation. The pattern is very clear. Once it is recognized that the source of these economic bubbles has been excessive credit creation, brought about by global current account imbalances, rather than e-crony capitalism or infectious greed, effective measures could be taken by the international community to combat the crisis and prevent the recurrence of bubble economies in the future. Recommendations as to the measures required and how they could be implemented are discussed in Part 4. Part 2. Flaws in the Dollar Standard Introduction the first part of this book described how the international monetary system that evolved out of the collapse of the Bretton Woods system has brought about extraordinary disequilibrium in the global economy. Part 2 will explain why the unwinding of the economic imbalances at the core of that disequilibrium is inevitable. There are three flaws inherent in the international monetary system as it now functions. The first is that it has brought about a situation where the health of the global economy depends on the United States going steadily deeper into debt to the rest of the world. That is a prerequisite that the United States will not be able to fulfill indefinitely. The second flaw is that the system creates asset price bubbles in the countries with balance of payments surpluses that wreck the banking sector and government finances of those countries when they pop. The third flaw is that it generates deflationary pressures that will continue to undermine corporate profitability so long as the trade imbalances at the core of the system continue to flood the world with excessive credit creation. Over the last 30 years, the United States has been transformed by its balance of payments deficits from the world's largest creditor into the world's most heavily indebted nation. At the end of 2001, the net indebtedness of the United States to the rest of the world amounted to 2.3 trillion US dollars, or approximately 23% of US GDP. The dollar standard has incentivized countries with balance of payment surpluses to reinvest their dollar surpluses in US dollar denominated assets. Those surpluses are expected to approach 500 billion US dollars, or 5% of US GDP, in 2002. Now, however, heavily indebted corporations and individuals in the United States are reaching the limit of their ability to service their debt, and bankruptcies are on the rise. Soon individuals will have to retrench and pay down their debt, while corporations will be unable to issue and service new credit instruments in sufficient amounts to enable the surplus countries to reinvest all of their dollar surpluses in dollar-denominated assets, at least not those issued by the private sector. Only the US government, which has recently begun to run large budget deficits again, will have the debt servicing capacity to meet that need over the next few years.
There are limits, however, to even the U.S. government's ability to incur debt. The U.S. current account deficit is approaching 5% of GDP and accelerating. It is only a matter of time before it will become impossible for the United States to continue increasing its indebtedness to the rest of the world at the rate of 5% of GDP per year. At that point, the countries with balance of payment surpluses will be forced to convert their dollar surpluses into their own currencies, causing a sharp appreciation in their currencies and a sharp decline in the value of the dollar. That shift will help restore equilibrium to the U.S. balance of payments, but also it will throw the major exporting nations into recession as their exports to the United States collapse. This predicament is described in chapters 5 and 6. A second flaw of the dollar standard is that it causes unsustainable asset price bubbles, both in the countries with large balance of payment surpluses and in the United States, the principal deficit country. Asset price bubbles, like all bubbles, are ephemeral by nature. When they pop, they tend to cause systemic banking crises that require costly government rescue packages for the financial sector. The fiscal health of the governments of Japan and the Asia crisis countries has been substantially impaired by the less than entirely successful attempts of those governments to stabilize their banking systems following the collapse of asset bubbles in those countries. Neither Japan nor any of the Asia crisis countries could afford to bail out the depositors of their banks a second time. However, so long as those countries continue to generate large balance of payment surpluses, the risk of a new round of hyperinflation in asset prices cannot be ruled out. A second round of asset, bubbles in Asia would inevitably end in fiscal crisis in a number of countries. Furthermore, the possibility of a costly financial sector crisis in the United States will also continue to increase so long as its current account deficits continue to boomerang back into that country as foreign capital inflows, feeding the asset price bubbles there. Chapter 7 addresses these issues. The third flaw in the international monetary system is that it generates deflation. As described in Part 1, enormous trade imbalances have facilitated a worldwide explosion of credit. Excessive credit expansion has resulted in overinvestment, excess capacity, and falling product prices in almost every industry. Falling prices are undermining corporate profitability and resulting in widespread corporate distress. So long as this system continues to flood the world with liquidity, corporate distress can only intensify. Credit-induced overinvestment is compounding the downward pressure on prices brought about by the precipitous relocation of the world's manufacturing facilities to very low-wage countries over the last 20 years. Chapter 8 analyzes why deflation has become a serious threat again for the first time since the Great Depression. The outlook for the global economy is profoundly disturbing. Until the dollar adjusts sharply lower, asset price bubbles and deflation will continue to undermine corporate profitability, banking systems, and government finances. When the dollar does fall, as it inevitably must, the global economic slump will intensify as the major exporting nations fall deeper into recession and the overheated U.S. economy deflates. This unfortunate state of affairs has arisen because of the international monetary system's most serious defect. The dollar standard lacks an adjustment mechanism to prevent persistent trade imbalances. Balance of payments deficits of an unprecedented magnitude have resulted in credit-induced economic overheating, on a global scale. The foundations for sustainable economic growth will not be restored until this flaw is corrected and the U.S. trade deficit ceases to flood the world with U.S. dollar liquidity. That will require that the dollar standard be replaced by a new international monetary system that does not generate, or even tolerate, rampant credit creation. Chapter 5. The New Paradigm Recession. A sound banker, alas, is not one who foresees danger and avoids it, but one who, when he is ruined, is ruined in a conventional and orthodox way along with his fellows, so that no one can really blame him. John Maynard Keynes. Introduction. For the last 20 years, the world's engine of economic growth has been fueled by credit. In 1980, the ratio of total debt to GDP in the United States was 169%. By early 2002, that ratio had almost doubled to 292%. American consumers and businesses took the credit they were offered and spent it. Strong consumer spending and brisk business investment fueled the U.S. economy and, through its current account deficits, the U.S. economy powered the world.
Now, however, the engine of global growth is flooded and beginning to stall. Too much credit has been extended that can't be repaid. Businesses have badly misallocated capital, and consumers have grown accustomed to living beyond their means. Bankruptcies are soaring as share prices plunge. The US economy is coming in for a hard landing, perhaps even a crash landing. This chapter explains why. Giving credit where credit isn't due. Sometimes economic growth causes loan growth, but at other times, it is credit growth that spurs economic growth. Generally, at the beginning of economic upswings, expanding economic growth generates credit growth. However, in the later stages of the business cycle, often it is credit growth that drives the economic growth, by facilitating overinvestment and profligate consumption. The business cycle turns down and recession begins when that credit cannot be repaid. In the United States, credit expansion has played a leading, perhaps the leading, role in the country's strong economic growth and booming stock markets over the last 20 years. As Figure 5.1 illustrates, the periods of strongest economic expansion, not to mention stock market excesses, the mid-1980s and from 1995 onward, corresponded to sharp increases in the ratio of the country's total debt to GDP. Figure 5.1 Credit-Fueled Expansion, the Ratio of Debt to GDP, 1969-2002, to Q1. Now, however, collapsing corporate profitability and record-breaking bankruptcies at both the corporate and the individual level are signaling the end of the longest economic boom on record. It is the nature of the business cycle, or the credit cycle, as it is sometimes referred to, that economic booms are followed by economic bust, and, generally, the bigger the boom, the bigger the subsequent bust. At the time of writing, July 2002, the economy had bounced back in the first quarter of 2002 from a shallow recession. In 2001 thanks to a very rapid reduction in interest rates to historically low levels. That reprieve has given rise to the hope that the worst has passed. Unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. The entire situation is reminiscent of the exchange between Julius Caesar and the soothsayer who had warned Caesar to beware the Ides of March. When that day arrived, proud Caesar, on his way to the Senate, met the soothsayer and mockingly pointed out that the Ides had arrived and that all was still well despite the predictions of doom. The soothsayer responded, yes, the Ides has arrived, but it has not yet passed. Caesar was hacked to death by his colleagues later that day. So it is in the United States. The day of economic reckoning has arrived. Ill omens and signs of looming disaster are glaringly obvious. And yet, the country continues to wear a brave face and to hope for the best. Just as well. Nothing can be done to prevent the economic downturn now, for, as Lionel Robbins wrote in his 1934 book, the Great Depression, it is agreed that to prevent the depression the only effective method is to prevent the boom, one sadly. It is way too late for that. Irrational exuberance and infectious greed have held sway for too long. The boom has been most apparent in share prices. The Dow Jones Industrial Average first broke above the 1,000 level in 1972. However, by late 1974, the index had fallen 40% from that peak. It was not until almost 1983 that the Dow was able to break through and remain above the 1000 index level. See figure 5.2. Not coincidentally, 1983 was also the year that the extraordinary and unprecedented deterioration of the US current account deficit began. The Dow's sustained rise above 1000 was the milestone that marked the beginning of the great end of the century stock market bubble. Figure 5.2 The Dow Jones Industrial Average, 1969-2002, Monthly Averages Between the beginning of 1983 and the end of the decade, the Dow rose 163%. Then, from 1990 to 2000, it rose a further 320% to 11,500. Within 17 years, the stock market soared more than 1,000%. It was a boom not unlike the one that put the roar in the roaring 20s, see Figure 5-3. Figure 5-3 Dow Jones Industrial Average, 1910-40, Monthly Close. The Business Cycle The U.S. economy, like every economy, is comprised of personal consumption expenditure, private investment, government spending, and net exports, see Figure 5.4. Figure 5.4 United States, Sector Contributions to 2001 GDP, Based on End Demand. 
In 2001, personal consumption expenditure accounted for 70% of final demand in the economy. Private investment accounted for 15% and government spending contributed 18%. Net exports of goods and services detracted 3% from GDP because imports into the United States exceeded U.S. exports abroad. The business sector and private investment. It has long been understood, although, from time to time, temporarily forgotten, that industrial economies expand in a cyclical manner. Private investment typically acts as the driving force in the business cycle. When businesses expand, jobs are created and personal consumption rises. When businesses rein in their investment, jobs are cut and personal consumption slows. Personal consumption makes up the largest share of end demand in all major economies, but private investment drives the cycle. It can be seen in Figure 5 of 5 that private investment rises more than consumption during periods of strong economic expansion, and contracts more during slumps. Table 5.1 provides a breakdown of U.S. GDP in 2001. Figure 5.5 United States, Real GDP, Private Investment, and Personal Consumption, 1955-2001. Table 5.1 United States, Breakdown of GDP, 2001. During the second half of the 1990s, the growth rate of private investment accelerated, see figure 5.6. The stock market boom inflated stock market capitalizations, making it easy for corporations to raise money cheaply by selling shares. The widening U.S. current account deficit also meant that the rest of the world had large dollar surpluses, substantial portions of which they were willing to invest in U.S. corporate bonds. Figure 5.6 United States, the annual average increase in private investment, 1955-99. During those years, private investment came to account for a larger portion of GDP than normal. The increase in the share accounted for by private investment in equipment and software was particularly pronounced, as .coms and telcos burned through cash as if there were no tomorrow, and, of course, as it turned out, for many of them there wasn't, see figure 5.7. Figure 5.7 United States, Investment in Equipment and Software as Percent of GDP, 1970-2001 The extraordinary economic growth and stock market boom of the second half of the 1990s gave rise to the belief that a new paradigm had made the business cycle obsolete. Faith in economic miracles rarely lasts very long, however. The new paradigm bubble began deflating rapidly in the spring of 2000 and the United States was once again in recession. The following year, corporate profitability began to suffer, see Figure 5.8. Figure 5.8 United States, corporate profits after tax, 1990-2001, percent change from previous year. Very quickly it became obvious that corporate America had made some tremendous mistakes during the bubble era, and, in 2002, the public learned that many of the largest corporations had resorted to fraud in an attempt to cover them up. Scandal followed scandal. In quick succession, Enron Corporation, Global Crossing, and WorldCom filed for bankruptcy, with combined assets of 196 billion US dollars, an amount considerably larger than all the assets of the 10 largest companies to file for bankruptcy during the 1980s and 1990s combined, see Table 5.2. When Arthur Anderson, one of the big four accounting firms, disintegrated after it was found guilty of obstructing justice by destroying documents in order to cover up malpractices, at Enron, faith in the entire system was shaken to the core. Stock markets plunged sharply during the summer of scandal. Table 5 to 2 The largest bankruptcies in the United States, 1980 to the present. Financial difficulties were not confined only to a few large companies either. Beginning in 1999, credit quality began to worsen all across the corporate sector and problems accelerated quickly thereafter. See figures 5.9 and 5.10. Figure 5.9 United States, total adversely rated syndicated loans, 1991-2002. Figure 5.10 United States, syndicated loans adversely rated as a percentage of total committed, 1991-2002. When the creditworthiness of the corporate sector began visibly to worsen, credit extension to the sector finally began to slow down. Business debt, which had increased by 12% in both 1998 and 1999, expanded at only a 2% annualized rate in the first quarter of 2002.
facing glutted markets and falling product prices on the one hand and a drastically reduced access to credit on the other. Corporations began to invest less and private investment plunged in 2001, see Figure 5.11. Figure 5.11 United States, Real GDP, Private Investment, and Private Consumption, 1988-2001. Hit hard by the troubles of its own making, the corporate sector was quick to fire workers. Between October 2000 and June 2002, the number of unemployed U.S. workers rose by 2.9 million to 8.4 million, an increase of 52%. The unemployment rate jumped from 3.9% to 5.9%, see Figure 5.12. Figure 5.12 United States, Unemployment Rate, 1948-2002. Falling investment and rising unemployment is the normal pattern when the business cycle begins to turn down. Personal consumption expenditure should have begun slowing sharply as well. Surprisingly, however, consumption remained robust despite rising joblessness and collapsing stock market wealth. This extraordinary divergence between the change in private investment and the change in personal consumption was due to trends in the credit market. The increase in business debt slowed to only 2% on an annualized basis in the first quarter of 2002. Cut off from new credit to refinance the old, many companies began going under. Credit to consumers continued to flow freely, however, see Figure 5.13. Figure 5.13 United States, Percent Change in Household and Business Sector Debt, 1981-2002, Q2, Annualized. For the time being, sharply rising consumer indebtedness is continuing to fuel consumption in the United States. Consumption is supporting the U.S. economy and, by extension, the global economy. However, consumers are beginning to have a very hard time servicing their debt. You can't get blood out of a stone, as they say. When new consumer credit is cut off, the game is up. Without new loans to help repay the old ones, the house of cards in the consumer lending business will come crashing down. The new paradigm recession will then begin in earnest. The household sector and personal consumption expenditure. American consumers are on a buying binge, a long one. Since 1980, household debt has risen from 50% of GDP to 78%. Even over the last two years, in spite of everything that has gone wrong, consumer spending has held up remarkably well. Their creditors have encouraged them. Borrowing has never been easier or cheaper. Mortgage financing and consumer credit have been flowing freely, see Figure 5.14. As one bank chairman recently put it, you'd have to be an insolvent arsonist not to get a loan right now. Figure 5.14 United States, an increasingly indebted society, mortgages and consumer credit as a percentage of GDP, 1980-2001. The question, of course, is how much more debt can the American consumer handle? Almost every indicator suggests that they are over-indebted relative to their income and their earning prospects. They are also filing for bankruptcy in record numbers. Debt cannot continue to expand more rapidly than income indefinitely, neither at the household level nor at the national level. In the United States, the rate of increase in personal income has slumped precipitously over the last two years, but the increase in consumer debt has not slowed. By the end of 2001, the annual increase in personal income had decreased to 2.5% the slowest pace in 40 years, while household debt continued to rise by more than 8% for the fourth year in a row. See Figure 5.15. Figure 5.15 United States, Personal Income, 1960-2002, percent change from previous year. The trend in wages and salaries tells the same story. The rate of increase in wages has plummeted in the United States since mid-2000 and is now on par with that corresponding with the recession in the early 1990s. Moreover, in the near term, with unemployment rising and corporate distress intensifying, wages seem more likely to begin falling in absolute terms, rather than rebounding, see Figure 5.16. Figure 5.16 United States, Wages and Salaries, 1947-2001, percent change year on year. Nor will the American consumer simply be able to cut back on the amount set aside as savings each month in order to continue shopping. The personal savings rate in the United States fell to its lowest recorded level during the final days of the new paradigm bubble. In 2000 and 2001, when, during 7 out of 24 months, 
Americans saved less than 1% of their income, see figure 5.17. For a point of comparison, consider that the average savings rate between 1959 and 1998 was 8.4%. This unprecedented paucity of savings strongly suggests that U.S. consumers will soon be forced to tighten their belts, reduce their borrowing, and cut back on their spending. Figure 5.17 United States, Personal Savings Rate, 1959-2001 And to service their debt and the rise in bankruptcies is no coincidence. The most alarming aspect of the sharp rise in the consumer's debt service burden is that it is occurring at a time when interest rates have never been lower. At the time of writing, the federal funds rate is 1.75%. Should interest rates begin to go up, a still larger portion of disposable income would have to be set aside as interest payments. Higher interest rates would inevitably push still more households into bankruptcy. Figure 5 to 18 United States, influence of total consumer debt on bankruptcy filing trends by year, 1980 to 2001. In light of all of the above, there can be little doubt that the American consumer is overextended financially. So long as subprime lenders keep the credit flowing in growing amounts, new loans can be drawn upon to repay the principal and interest on the old ones, with some left over for a trip to the mall. And, so long as mortgage providers continue to push out new mortgage loans and Fannie Mae continues to buy them, property prices will continue to rise. Unfortunately, with personal income depressed and unemployment rising, it won't take long for the property market to become unaffordable to many, and then for most. Every Ponzi scheme ends in crisis. The great end of the century consumer credit bubble will be no different. When the consumer folds and begins to rein in his debt, there will be ramifications throughout the debt market. Hardest hit will be the financial sector. The federally related mortgage pools, government sponsored enterprises, GSEs, issuers of asset-backed securities, and commercial banks all depend on the expansion of consumer credit for their growth. Rising consumer bankruptcies are signaling that the extraordinary credit-induced spending spree in the United States will soon come to an end. Problems that were manageable when new credit was easily available will become crises as consumer credit growth slows. Distraught creditors will turn off the credit taps and a new credit crunch will begin. The government sector. There are two positive observations that can be made about the fiscal condition of the U.S. government. The first is that, as a percentage of GDP, government debt is not as high as it was in the mid-1990s. The second is that, despite the government's heavy indebtedness, it would be very surprising if it encountered much difficulty in raising trillions of dollars more debt if it chose to do so. This latter point is very important, not only because the government's finances have once again begun to deteriorate badly but even more so because the government will be forced to run much larger budget deficits in the years immediately ahead, if the current recession is not to become something much worse. The federal government's total debt is US$6 trillion, or roughly 58% of GDP, see figure 5.19. In absolute terms, it has never been higher. It has increased every year without interruption since 1956. However, as a percentage of GDP, it is well below its peak level set in 1995 when it hit 67% of GDP. Figure 5 to 19 total U.S. federal government debt, 1954 to 2002, March. Approximately 57% of the government's total debt, or 3.4 trillion U.S. dollars, is held by the public and see Table 5.3. The rest, 2.6 trillion US dollars, is held in the government accounts listed in Table 5.3. Table 5.3 United States, public debt held in government accounts, March 2002, US dollars million. The public has been led to believe that the government achieved a budget surplus from 1998 to 2001. That is not really the complete truth. The government has been counting a large part of the contributions paid into Social Security and some of the contributions paid into the pension plans of government employees as government revenues, without counting the government's obligations to pay benefits in the future as government liabilities. At present, Social Security and the government employee pension plans receive more in contributions than they pay out in benefits, generating a surplus. The government includes that surplus as part of government revenues. By doing so, it made the government's budget appear to be in surplus from 1998 to 2001. That is not all. 
The government has been spending part of the current surpluses of Social Security and the government pension plans on other things. The amounts involved are huge, totaling almost $1 trillion US dollar over the past five years alone. When the government spends the current surpluses of those retirement plans, it gives them non-marketable government IOUs in exchange. It is those IOUs that comprise most of the debt securities held in the government accounts listed above. In other words, the government has spent most of the Social Security Trust Fund. Social Security is an unfunded pension scheme. Some of the government employee pension plans are also, at least partially, unfunded. It is illegal for a private company to have unfunded pension plans. It is not illegal for the government to do so, however. Nor is it illegal for government officials to tell the public that there is a large budget surplus, without explaining how that is possible when the government's debt continues to rise year after year. Of course, Social Security's problems go deeper than that. Because of unfavorable demographic trends, within 20 years, annual payments into the social security system will be insufficient to meet the benefits then due to be paid to retirees. So, the system that is currently generating a surplus, which the government spends on other things, will soon begin to generate very large deficits that will add to the government's liabilities at that time. It is no surprise that the general public recognizes there is a crisis within the social security system. They just don't yet realize that the social security surplus was appropriated to make it appear that the government achieved a budget surplus from 1998 to 2001. The purpose of the preceding discussion was to explain the true state of the U.S. government's financial position, not to suggest that problems with the social security system will result in a near-term fiscal disaster. With any luck, the insolvency of the social security system will play a leading role in some future economic crisis, rather than in the current one. Figure 5.20 presents the trends in both total government debt and in that portion of government debt held by the public. The difference between the two is the amount of government debt held in government accounts, such as the Federal Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund, which was created under the Social Security Act. Figure 5.20 U.S. federal government debt as a percentage of GDP, both total debt and debt held by the public, 1980-2002, Q1. For the sake of simplicity, the rest of this section will focus primarily on only that part of the government debt that is held by the public. This will minimize confusion, since that is the way the government generally has presented its debt and its budgets to the public. Between 1980 and 1997, government budget deficits ran out of control. Over that period, government debt held by the public increased by 3.1 trillion US dollars. As a percentage of GDP, it increased from 33% to 65%. However, beginning in 1998, the U.S. government not only balanced its budget, but actually achieved a budget surplus, of a type, see above, over four straight years, see figure 5.21. Two tax increases, the first during the generated by the overheated economy. In particular, capital gains taxes surged as the stock market blew into an enormous bubble. Figure 5.21 The U.S. government's budget has fallen back into deficit, 1980-I-2003-F. Extrapolating those trends indefinitely into the future, politicians and political functionaries published absurd projections showing that government revenues would continue to be so strong over the next decade that the entire $3.8 trillion U.S. dollars in government debt held by the public would be paid off by 2010. The second Bush administration went so far as to enact a large, multi-year tax cut in 2001, just as much of the government's bubble-inflated tax revenues began to disappear. When the stock market crashed, the capital gains that had generated so much tax revenue quickly turned into capital gains losses that could be used to offset other taxes owed to the government. Very suddenly, projections that had shown endless budget surpluses were revised to show multi-year deficits. The budget surplus in fiscal year 2001 came to 127 billion US dollars. For fiscal year 2002, a deficit of 165 billion US dollars is now expected, according to the Office of Management and Budget. This turnaround represents a deterioration of 290 billion US dollars from one year to the next. Looking ahead, as the recession worsens, a very sharp blowout in the government's budget deficit should be anticipated as tax revenues continue to fall and as expenditure programs designed to stimulate the economy are launched. 
it is quite likely that by 2004, if not sooner, the budget deficit will exceed the record of 290 billion US dollars set in 1992. The good news is that the government can afford to go deeper into debt. In fact, large-scale deficit spending by the government may well be absolutely necessary over the next five years to prevent a severe recession from becoming a depression. Government spending accounts for only 18% of the end demand in the economy, compared with 15% for private investment and 70% for personal consumption. Nonetheless, aggressive deficit spending can support the economy and generate badly needed jobs at a time when the other sectors of the economy are contracting. Furthermore, the sale of large amounts of U.S. Treasury bonds will supply secure debt instruments that the United States trading partners will require if they are to reinvest their dollar surpluses into dollar-denominated assets in the years immediately ahead, a subject that is elaborated on in the following chapter. The U.S. government would have little trouble financing a $500 billion U.S. dollar annual budget deficit each year, between 2002 and 2005, as an addition of $2 trillion U.S. dollars in debt would only increase its debt held by the public to approximately 50% of GDP by the end of that period, even though total government debt would increase to almost 75% of GDP. Compare that with the Japanese government's debt which, during 12 years of post-bubble economic difficulties, has ballooned to approximately 140% of GDP without, yet, provoking a crisis. In 2001, the federal government paid $359.5 billion US dollars in interest expense on its total debt of around $5.8 trillion US dollars, implying an average rate of interest near 6.2%, see figure 5.22. Should total federal debt jump to $8 trillion US dollars by the end of 2005, the government's interest expense would increase to just under 500 billion US dollars annually, equivalent to roughly 4.5% of GDP, assuming the rate of interest it pays on its debt remains at the same level and an annual increase in GDP of 2% a year. In 1991, the government's interest expense was higher than that, reaching the equivalent of 4.8% of GDP. Therefore, there is little reason to fear that the government could not service the interest payments on 8 trillion US dollars in debt. In 2005, figure 5.22 U.S. government interest expense on total debt, 1988-2001. The ability of the government to spend generously may be the only factor that keeps the U.S. economy from falling completely into crisis between now and then, as the heavily indebted corporate and household sectors are forced to retrench and all the excesses of the new paradigm era are unwound. There are risks, however that the government's finances could deteriorate much more drastically than anticipated in the preceding paragraphs. Systemic banking crises typically accompany the implosion of economic bubbles. The Japanese government and the governments of the Asia crisis countries were required to go deeply into debt to salvage their banks, when their economic bubbles ended in crises. During the Great Depression, a third of all U.S. banks failed. The economic excesses in the United States during the second half of the 1990s were unprecedented. Extraordinary financial leverage was built up as unimaginably large amounts of derivatives and other credit-related instruments were put into place for the first time. The possibility cannot be ruled out that the unwinding of that leverage will bring down a significant portion of the U.S. banking sector. In such a scenario, bad case becomes a worse case very quickly. Similarly, should the government-sponsored enterprises, such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, come unglued under the enormous debt they built up during the 1990s, the government might also decide to come to the rescue of their creditors even though it does not formally guarantee the GSE debt. At the end of 2001, the debt of GSEs amounted to US$2.25 trillion. US dollars. Either scenario could cost the government hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of dollars. But still yet, the financial cloud of the U.S. government is such that it could raise sufficient credit to resolve any conventional financial sector crisis and, simultaneously, stimulate the economy through large-scale spending programs. Only one, very worst-case scenario could truly break the bank, a systemic meltdown of the $150 trillion U.S. dollar derivatives market. The derivatives market has grown from roughly $10 trillion U.S. dollars in 1990 to $150 trillion U.S. dollar today a size approximately five times larger than the annual economic output of the entire world. It is an industry in itself, and one shrouded in mystery. It could prove to be the global economy's Achilles heel, 
Any systemic meltdown of the derivatives market could be too costly for even the U.S. government to fix. To summarize, then, with debt equivalent to 60% of GDP and huge unfunded contingent liabilities for the social security system, the U.S. government's financial position is not good. However, it is not so bad that it will block the government from aggressively increasing its deficit spending in the years immediately ahead, in an attempt to prevent the economy from collapsing into depression. The ability of the United States to fund large-scale Keynesian stimulus programs holds out the greatest hope that this recession will not spiral into crisis. In all probability, U.S. government deficit spending will come to the rescue of the global economy. The U.S. government can be relied on to spend enough to stave off economic collapse. During the midst of the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt told his nation, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Today, the only reason to fear is not fear itself. It is the possibility that a derivatives market meltdown could cause a global systemic banking collapse that no government could afford to repair. Conclusion The aim of this chapter has been to demonstrate, first, that the business and household sectors in the United States are overly indebted, second, that the inability of those sectors to increase their indebtedness further makes an economic slump in the United States inevitable, and, finally, that deficit spending by the government should prevent the recession from becoming a depression, despite the extraordinary excesses that have occurred in America in the 1980s and 1990s. The impact that the intensifying U.S. recession will have on the rest of the world is taken up in Part 3. First, Chapter 6 will describe why the unwinding of the new paradigm excesses must drive the dollar sharply lower.